in session. Good morning, you may be seated. We are here on our cause number 1CASA150235 Edwards versus Mraz. Uh, Council, as you know, each side is allotted 20 minutes for your argument. The, uh, the petitioner may choose to reserve some of your time. If you do, you're in charge of keeping track of that. The clock on the podium will reflect the total amount of time you have remaining, including what you may have decided to reserve. We've, uh, we've read your papers. We have uh, done some independent research of our own and we have uh, into the law. And we have uh, discussed the case at some length among us in more than one conferences. Um, we record these proceedings. I should have mentioned this before. We record these proceedings. So when you approach the podium and for the petitioner each time, please recite your name and um, the name of your client so that when we go back and listen or watch the tape, we'll know who's who. With that, you may begin. Good morning, Your Honors. Daniel Rainek on behalf of Mr. Edwards. I have nothing to add and, and certainly here to answer questions. I believe we've set forth in the pleadings, um, including the responsive reply pleading, um, what their experts had said, and I think I've detailed that. Well, I will tell you that what, what let me begin. Uh, we, we've, uh, we are inclined to uh, take up the issue this morning only of what uh, uh, the order only to the extent that it affects opening statement, given the uh, given that we have no way of knowing what will happen at trial, how the evidence will come in at trial, uh, we are reluctant to step in to do more than that. Although, if you have a different view, let's hear it, either one of you. We're also interested in knowing whether there is a consensus between the two of you on what the order allows and doesn't allow in, in opening. Um, it's pretty sparsely worded. It's pretty broadly worded. Um, so do you have views on those topics? And, yeah, and what, invite colleagues? what do you want to say that you think you can't say in opening? Uh, anything relating to the fact that there is going to be no physical evidence linking Mr. Edwards to any of the abuse. Don't you think you can say, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we don't think the state is going to bring you any evidence that links Mr. Edwards to whatever. No, I, I think it's pretty clear from not just um, we didn't provide the whole record, the FTR and everything. It's, I think it's pretty clear that the court, if I broached that topic, uh, it would open the door. I'm absolutely convinced of that. There's no question in my mind. Do Based you, on other things where they've said just in something I'll say I didn't cover that on cross. Well, you broached the subject. Any, any even, I'm just telling, I can only tell the court based on what's happened. I, I try to tailor my, we're in an evidence you're hearing now. I've tried to tailor sometimes where I don't want to go into something on cross. And if it's even tangentially related, it's come in. So what, to answer the court's question, it would, it would absolutely come in in my, in my view. In other words, if, if an opening statement, you're actually making an opening statement and, and not arguing too much and you're you're actually talking about what the evidence will show including what you believe the state's evidence will show you don't think you can say uh, i uh, we don't expect the state to present to you any any hard physical evidence where, where are you going to say that that connects my client to may 20 30th whatever whatever, I'm whatever, whatever the dates are absolutely convinced if I said anything along those lines that would open the door. Her, her order says, as I recall, it says you, that you better not, you better not argue there is no evidence. Right. 
And obviously it, the, the key is the physical evidence because there is, there's nothing else to argue. Now, the state, uh, their other argument is that uh, our client was either a caretaker or had some custody over the child and so should have reported it. But that's a separate and distinct issue as we see it um, that goes to other issues in terms of the confessions, et cetera. So our defense is two-pronged. One, that he was not aware of the extent of the abuse because the mother was the one bathing, clothing the kid. Um, you know, there's a picture as late as um, uh, May 27th where the child basically has no injuries. And this is three days, I mean, uh, clothed. I, I'm not going to say unclothed, but clothed. There's essentially no injuries. So, um, and, and there's actually some other evidence on the day of that she had no visible injuries once you consider the clothing as part of it. To answer the court's second question that started out, just so the court understands the current posture, uh, we have a, another issue that the judge is actually um, holding um, a hearing on next Thursday. After we finish the one hearing, she's going to decide a second issue. And so we can't talk about that in our openings either. So I know that you were set to have a, you know, to consider this on the 22nd. I, I'm, I'm not going to tell you the state's position. I know the state wanted to get into this other hmm information um, in their opening. So we're, we're going to be requesting, it's obviously up to you, to at least if you're going to conference on the 22nd to make that decision then because we're not even in trial on the 24th and I know the state wanted to get in this other evidence and that's also critical evidence. So either way, the opening, there's going to be a problem with the opening is what I'm trying to tell the court either way. Is that is that Thursday hearing, is that the topic of what I understand is another special action pending? Yes. Okay, we're, we're not that panel, and I, we don't I, know anything about that. I understand that, but the court indicates that they're going to, I'm not saying the Court of Appeals, the trial court, if we finish our this one hearing, they're going. she's going to address that issue, we believe, next Thursday. Are, should, are, are you set for openings on Monday? Yes. Okay. So I, I'm answering the court's question as to delay and how it's going to affect the opening, because I think this other issue is also going to affect the opening. I'm not asking you to rule on that. Our understanding from the order that you were going to conference on the 22nd. No, we're well, going to try to rule before Friday. That's that, fine. I, I just I was just going by the written order. No, that, yeah, that that's saying? exactly right. We were, we were uh, you know, we 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 didn't we we regretted having to stay the trial. And we did so in as short a period of time as we could to allow briefing. And we were committed internally to deciding, to getting out an order to allow the, the openings to proceed on Monday, having the benefit for what it's worth of our guidance. Uh, understanding that you may not have your, your opening statement completely scripted out, and, uh, but can you, can you give us kind of your, precisely what you think you would be saying on relating to the physical evidence? Yes, but, I would. But for the order or with the order? Uh, but for the order. But for the order, we would be going through, because the court's already ruled that the co-defendant statements come in, we would be providing some detail, not argument, but detail as to various things that she admitted over a period of time and going through and then de contrasting it with our client's statement, which the court is allowing part of that to come in in the state's case, not the whole thing. She found that part of it was not voluntary. And so we would be we would be providing some detail. Um, I've already got a PowerPoint presentation that was ready before the, the stay was done. And so uh, when we got that ruling, it had completely changed what we were going to do because of what we, are you going to say that you would you think she will find opens the door? What I'm going to ask the jury to do is please keep careful notice of the fact that we anticipate that the state will not be able to prove or demonstrate any physical evidence or any evidence of any kind that our client actually physically abused the child. And as I understand it, and I'm, I'm confident of this, that uh, that would open the door as I read the court's order and knowing the judge based on what she said on if the topic is essentially covered, it's wide open. That's how she's been during the hearing. If it's even even broached, it's, it, it allows them to, uh, you know, redirect on that, and I think the same would apply for this and would clearly open the door. Is it, is it, is your understanding, though, that, that, that the court would make that open the door ruling only if uh, the state raises an objection to something that you say? No, I think it says that it's, it's going to allow it in and the state wants it in. So I don't think they have to raise an objection. We've already argued the issue. They've already determined it's late disclosure. But if we comment that there's no evidence, and again, we would spe specify physical evidence or verbal evidence, you know, any statements by my client that he physically abused the child, 
um, that that would open the door. There is a, an instance where my our client told the child to get in the bath. He didn't put her in the bath. The bath was too hot. But our contention is that that burn, that the child the scarring on that buttocks is not related to that injury. So, and I don't think that by itself would open the door arguing that. It would be that there's no other evidence. And I understand they may try to make that distinction on that, but I, we would be arguing beyond that that there is no evidence that he physically abused a child, which I think is absolutely critical for the jury's mindset going in to, to look to look for that to see if if our contention of what we believe the evidence in opening is actually uh, true or not. So, so the issue as far as you're concerned is that the existing order would preclude you from uh, uh, dis describing the evidence that you believe that the state will offer uh, right? and 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 your uh, the cases seem to make a distinction between uh, asserting there is no evidence even an opening and 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 saying you will hear no evidence or the state will offer no evidence but it do you understand the distinction? Judge, I do, but the, one of the issues is it's not only that. If I start to question any witnesses or make my argument in closing, she's, gonna, she's indicated she'd strike the argument. So at the end of the case, if I make that argument and, our, and my argument is struck, that would be, a, no pun intended, a death blow to our case on a death penalty case. So uh, I, it, it's, it's, more, it, it's not just the opening. It's the concern all the way through. I understand this court is concerned right now just for the opening, but I'm concerned for the whole thing. And the bottom line is, I believe that I am more than walking on eggshells. And I, I don't feel, and I don't disagree with the court that it's a very broad order. And I see it as so broad that it it's allows the trial court to basically say almost anything I said and the state to argue, and I'm sure that they're going to argue that I open the door if I talk about almost anything. And I believe, based on what has occurred, that the judge is going to say that's correct. Um, and again, I, I, you're asking me, and each case is unique, but based on things that I've carefully, in my opinion, tried to steer away from on cross-examination, and the court said, well, no, it's, it's, well, this topic is a related topic, so it comes in. I'm just knowing the court, the court views everything in a much broader scope than perhaps other judges. Not a criticism, it's just it, that's the reality of what I'm dealing with. Isn't that, a, isn't that something that can be addressed on appeal? It, it's, it's difficult to micromanage a trial before it happens. I, I don't disagree, Your Honor, but I think this is different because I think it, it's directly based on Jimenez, and what it is, it's penalizing the defense for the fact that for three years they could have got this tested. And this is not, you could say there was a backup in the lab, and I get that on a drug case that goes to trial in eight months, and you say, okay, they only got the lab results 30 days before because of the backup. This was three years later on a death penalty case. I see that as, as apples and oranges, Your Honor, um, in terms of that. But some of the prejudice is because you think the evidence will come in if, if there's a retrial, if it's reversed, if the judge's ruling is reversed on appeal, you think the evidence will... Oh, absolutely, because now we lose the argument, and, and if we, it's also the speedy, the whole thing of Jimenez is you can't bring this in at the last minute and then have it prejudice the defendant. That's, that's I see, the holding in Jimenez. And in this case, far different, as I understand it, Jimenez, they had those, they tried to get those lab results. In other words, those were submitted early on. They just didn't get them for a few months. This was three years later before they even decided, almost three years later before they even decided to submit it, but which is inexcusable. Isn't that also an argument that can be made uh, on, who? on appeal? And it, assuming assuming uh, the judge makes a mistake uh, in restricting your argument, whether in closing, and how, why and, and what should happen at the next trial? So do I go and do the opening I was planning on doing and hoping that a court of appeals of my clients convicted and sentenced to death reverses it. I have a real problem, a real issue with that, Your Honor, based on the scope of a menace and the fact that they're really getting the benefit. They're, they're precluding our defense based on their late disclosure. That's the only way that I could, I could say it. I think it's not an issue. I think it has to be clearly defined. As the court knows, Jimenez is a recent case, and no one has defined the total scope of what Jimenez should be um, in terms of can it in any way detriment the the defense. And I certainly don't intend to argue there's no DNA evidence of the child on my client. I mean, something like that, which I would agree, you know, might be an issue. I simply, and the final point all along is, and, and where I think the court also erred, and judge, this one may be more of an appeal issue, but how does that relate to physical abuse? It's not blood spatter. I've shown you what, what the experts have said. They're not even sure it's blood. 
Um, they're not even sure it's human blood, if it is blood. So they're, they're, they're taking, I wouldn't say a leap of faith. I think it's an inappropriate uh, leap to try to argue that that is evidence of physical abuse. And, but the court bought into that argument, which, which I couldn't understand. That may be more of an appeal issue, but I think when you couple it with the other issue, it's very, very concerning to us. Okay. Thank you. Is there anything else right now? Uh, Mr. Rena? Not right now. All right. Okay, thank you. thank you. Counsel. Thank you, Your Honors, and may it please the court. My name is Ryan Green. Um, with me also is co-counsel Karen Kemper and also co-counsel Kirsten Valenzuela, and we represent the real party in interest, the state of Arizona. Uh, I, I appreciate the clarification that the court's concern is now really going to be focused on opening statement. However, when it comes to the general principles, of what we were going to be talking about today, it's still pretty much the same. Our position is that the trial court's order, specifically this cautionary language, whether it relates to opening statement, questioning of a witness, or closing argument, this is language that goes to the heart of what kind of legal system we should have. What that ruling is protecting is the first and most fundamental value of our legal system, which is finding the truth, even when evidence has been precluded, whether it's for... I agree with you. I think you're arguing that the defense counsel can't lie to the jury. Th that is correct. I would hope the same is true, of course, for, to the, for the prosecutors. That is abs uh, it, it, probably even more so. But, but is that really what we're talking about here? Or, or, do, you, or do, do you see a problem with defense counsel in this case saying to the jury in opening that uh, the state is not g going to present any hard evidence to you of, of uh, molestation or whatever it is on, on May 30, uh, you know, in describing what the evidence is believed to be. And that's what you do in opening. Do you see, do you see a problem with that? No. Well, let me explain. From the state's standpoint, uh, there are still two problems even with that type of seemingly benign statement in opening statements. For example, the state is not going to present any hard physical evidence. Uh, normally, in a vacuum, that type of statement would certainly be proper. Uh, but the, the number one point is this. It is still going to carry the danger of giving a false impression or a misleading impression to the jury that there is no hard physical evidence. Well, and, well, let me ask you if during closing arguments, is it fair game to say the state has not presented uh, hard physical evidence? Uh, our position would be twofold. Number one, it would, again, just as an opening statement, carry the danger. If you oh, just focus oh, yeah. on, on okay. in closing, it's, it's evidence has been kept out. Um, is there something that's fair game for defense counsel to argue? You have not heard any evidence. You have not seen any physical evidence that links my client to any injury on the day. That, the, uh, the issue day that of whether or not that statement would be misleading is going to depend upon the context because uh, such a statement, again, a seemingly innocuous, benign statement that would be made in probably in many closing arguments. The state has not presented any evidence of, of hard physical evidence that my client abused Torn on that particular day. By itself in a vacuum, that may very well be proper. But what if that statement comes on the heels of discussion about forensic evidence? But the, the concern here for, from defense counsel's perspective, you're saying that that very well may be proper under the judge's ruling, she seems to be suggesting that there's no way um, he can say that. So are, are you, what would you do if you're in defense counsel's <laughs> position? If I were in defense counsel's position, I would not make an argument that I believe is going to leave a false impression in the mind of the jury. But, but can't you comment on what was or was not presented at trial? Not if it unfairly exploits the absence or preclusion of evidence. At the at the close of the state's case, presumably the defense is going to make a Rule 20 motion. Correct. When Judge Mraz considers that motion, she can't consider the fact that DNA evidence was found on the swim trunks, can she? That's correct. So how is it leaving a false impression for the jury if at the summation defense counsel says there's no physical evidence that, that, that ties my clients to the injury? The judge can certainly make the Rule 20 determination based on the evidence that has been admitted at trial. And so, too, with the jury, they have to base their verdict 
on the evidence that's presented at trial. However, where the line is drawn, and this is a line where advocacy must yield to accuracy or a trial tactic is going to have to yield to the truth. And in, when you're making an argument that you know is simply not true, and it would not be true. What's untrue about saying, you, ladies and gentlemen, you haven't heard from the state any evidence of such and such? What's untrue about that? What is untrue about it, again, in a vacuum, it may seem true. However, it would be a misrepresentation by omission. It is the type of thing that was discussed in the Massachusetts cases. But those uh, are prosecutor cases. They are. They're not, they're, we're not talking about a Sixth Amendment right here to force the, the state to prove its case. Well, in addition, you're, you are correct that it is not a process. Those are prosecutor cases, and that's not what we're talking about here. Nonetheless, the rules of professional responsibility will also still govern, and that includes not only candor to the tribunal, but also preventing a misrepresentation. And misrepresentation by omission is, again, a misrepresentation. Have you, can you cite us any case that support that, that is where the court has uh, precluded the defense from saying in opening that you will see no evidence or saying in closing you have seen no evidence? Well, I believe in our response, one example that actually there were s several examples. One would be the Florida case. The I believe it was Bouta v. State, where you have a detective who was not called by the state because of the fact that there was evidence that that detective had that was precluded. The defense turned around, I believe, and ended up calling that detective and did it in a manner to suggest that the state had been hiding evidence. Well, but but that's not this case. What I'm asking is, do you have any case like this case? I believe the next one would be, I think it is the Hernandez case out of Florida, yeah. where uh, the, and I understand that. The, that that's a civil, the civil case. case. Move yes. on. You got a criminal <laughs> case like this one. That's my question. I don't, for closing arguments, a criminal case, I, off the top of my head, I cannot think of one. I know in our response to, I believe, the motion to reconsider the ruling on the DNA issue. In other words, the court. Again, the court precluded the DNA, but maintained this cautionary language. The petitioner then filed a motion to reconsider. We filed a response. And my understanding is um, that I'm, I'm trying to, I, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. I'm the, sorry. <laughs> we've, got all, we've got all morning, so yes. take the time. No, no, it, the, the question I want to make sure I'm addressing but, is. What, is there a case like this one where the, where the order precludes the defense lawyer, not from saying in this case, I mean, what what your papers contain are cases that would apply if the defense lawyer in this case would say, well, you saw no DNA evidence. Well, I mean, that's pretty close to implying a falsehood. What I'm wondering are, are there any cases that would, that affirm an order barring a defense lawyer from saying at opening, you will see no evidence. The state will offer no evidence. Or at closing, you have seen no evidence. The state has offered no evidence. With respect to the opening statements, I am not aware of that case. Um, with respect to closing arguments, I, I, I am trying to remember if People v. Hill, the New York case that I cited, now I believe in that case it was a situation where the defense may have then brought out the evidence that had been precluded to try to create that false impression that the state had been hiding. So that may not be yeah. on point. So to answer the court's question, as I stand here right now, I don't think that I found a specific case on that issue. Um, you know, the, the state was attempting to really focus broadly on the opening the door doctrine. For example, the Kemp case was one example. And our position is that what the trial court was doing here was simply applying the open the door doctrine. This is a long standing doctrine. So you have the trial court applying well recognized law to the facts of the case. And, and this is important from the state standpoint. This is a trial judge who is exceedingly familiar with the facts. She has ruled upon motion after motion. There was, I believe, in the attachments enough minute entries that you can get a feel for the fact that there was a lengthy voluntariness hearing, there was a Cronus hearing. Um, and again, the number and volume of motions that have been litigated. So the law that was being applied, for example, Kemp, 
uh, where the language no evidence is used. Again, understanding it's in the context of questioning a witness, but this is still the concept, that longstanding concept of opening the door. Um, and so from our standpoint, recognizing that the defense certainly has a duty to advocate for their client, which can separate the cases that the state cited, which deal with prosecutors from defense counsel. Some of that could also be just a function of the way in which the legal system works, whereas the state doesn't have the ability to appeal a not guilty. So the bulk of the case law is naturally going to be dealing with these issues when it comes to what the prosecutor did. But in the end, whether you're a prosecutor or whether you're a defense attorney, we are bound by the rules of professional responsibility. And it's not just Rule 3.3 or Rule 8.4. It's also the oath of admission to, the, uh, to become a lawyer, where you have to pursue methods that are consistent with truth and honor. And our position is that there are, there's no question that it may put defense in a difficult position. Uh, I believe the defense counsel talked about how, you know, what am I supposed to do you know, without opening the door, walking on eggshells. Unfortunately, though, that is a function at times of being a lawyer. Evidence is precluded all the time. Well, you, you wouldn't, you would agree, wouldn't you, that um, consistent with ethics and the rules and the Constitution, the prosecutor, your colleagues, couldn't uh, uh, absent opening the door, couldn't get up and, and somehow imply to the jury that there is evidence out there that has been suppressed and it's not going to see, it's not going to see. That would absolutely be misconduct. Then, then why is it unethical or improper or for a defense lawyer to, uh, uh, <laughs> to tell the jury that, uh, to make argument based on what the jury has seen. Yes, this, this comes to the issue then of what our legal system ought to be and what it is for that matter. We have a system we understand where the facts as they actually exist in the real world are often winnowed by rules of evidence, rules of discovery, and, and other pretrial rulings. So what we end up with, and there was, there was a, there's a Superior Court judge who I respect very much who once told me, broke my heart, but said that, Mr. Green, there is a difference between fact and trial fact. Now, the question I think that this court is now looking at, and perhaps I, I think it's a fundamental one, how far afield can trial fact get from the facts as they actually exist? It, I apologize for interrupting and sort of reassociating, but... Sometimes evidence is precluded because there's some concern about the reliability of the evidence. And why is it unfair? I mean, this someone's confession was precluded because there was, it may have been um, unduly influenced. There, why is it unfair for defense counsel to comment on the absence of evidence when evidence has, in fact, been precluded and there presumably was a... Uh, a basis other than just late disclosure uh, for for not being allowed to present it, and, and is so. It, 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 I still get to the end of why can't they just say this is the evidence that's been presented? You haven't seen you haven't seen other evidence. Or, this is all there is. <laughs> yeah, there you raised. A, uh, there was a key word that you used. Sometimes evidence is precluded because it's not reliable. The best example being, of course, voluntariness of statements. When a statement is, is excluded because of voluntariness reasons, reason, the idea is that it is not reliable. It's not just protecting the value under the Fifth Amendment against compelled self-incrimination. Well, can defense it, counsel say my client did not confess? In a voluntariness situation? Right, the confession has been excluded. I think in a voluntariness situation, Yes, but not in a Miranda violation, given the Harris case, and I believe it was the Harris case, the United States Supreme Court case, where, in that case, they recognized that the value that's being served by the exclusionary rule of statements taken in violation of Miranda have to yield to the truth-finding function of our legal system. 
Likewise, in the Havens case, the other United States Supreme Court case that I believe was mentioned, there you had evidence that was seized in violation of the Fourth Amendment. But again, when Mr. Havens testified that he would have had nothing to do with the cutting up of the shirt and putting drugs in it, this, the government was allowed to impeach with that evidence. So the, going back to your question then is how do we, there are, there are limits and there are boundaries and what the trial court did here was one of those boundaries to how far we can use the preclusion of evidence. And what we're talking about here, and this is perhaps one of the most important points, what we're talking about here is not a violation of a constitutional magnitude. We are talking about a violation of a procedural rule, Rule 15. How is it not a, how is the, or, or, or maybe I'm misunderstanding you. What I understand the petition to raise is that the, the, the argument that the limit, the limit the order places on his opening statement and his closing argument is of constitutional dimension. Or, or were you referring to the preclusion order itself not being a constitutional mention. I was referring to the the rule itself okay. uh, being and distinguishing that from violations of the Fourth Amendment or violations of Miranda, which I believe until the Dickerson case in early 2000s was it was difficult to determine whether or not in fact it was of constitutional magnitude. And the point being is that if the United States Supreme Court has already made a judgment, a policy judgment that we will not allow the exclusion of evidence to, for example, in the Harris case, become a license to use perjury by way of a defense, well then, under the circumstances here, where we have evidence that was disclosed, and as the court is aware, you know, to the extent that the facts of underlying this disclosure are important, this disclosure was made one month and 15 days prior to opening statements, and the trial court did find that there was no bad faith. The trial court did find that there was, uh, however, no or a lack of due diligence. And I, I, I will say, though, that the punishment or the sanction under Rule 15 has to be proportionate. I believe that the precedents under Rule 15 still say that preclusion itself is a last resort. We go to the, the sanction that will affect the merits of the case and the evidence the least. And the circumstances of this case are very different than a lot of other Rule 15 cases. The petitioner cites Jimenez, and there are a number of extremely important distinctions between this case and the Jimenez case. One of those distinctions is the fact that this trial is not, is not the same type of a trial where you have jury selection quickly and probably seamlessly followed by opening statements and the presentation of evidence. Um, what happened here, disclosure occurred long before these witnesses would have been testifying. Another important distinction, in the Jimenez case, this court was concerned about the fact that the state had announced ready. However, the record in this case is replete with instances of the assigned prosecutor at the time, Deputy County Attorney Valenzuela, pointing out the problems with trial conflicts, um, her role as not being necessarily involved in the guilt phase. And then in addition to that, and this may be the most important distinction between the facts here and the Jimenez case, in Jimenez what you had was the ultimate, the ultimate ruling of the trial court required an extension of the last day under Rule 8. That has not happened here and, and was never going to. We weren't going to ask for it. Instead, we've got this schedule that has a lot of the time to prepare built in. It's similar, and the state's position is perhaps more similar to what we see in the CODA case that was cited by the state. Um, so I, I, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. And yeah. So I think that there's a, a number of distinctions between the case at hand and what happened in Jimenez. Uh, You're suggesting this is part of the remedy for the late disclosure is it's not coming in, but I am going to put more restrictions maybe than would otherwise be, be placed. Is that what you're suggesting? Your Honor, I believe that that is, I believe that that is perhaps part of it, but I think I would go even farther. The Jimenez case, and I'm not aware of any Rule 15 case that actually would undo 
and negate the long-standing principle of opening the door, of fair response, and perhaps even more importantly of doing anything to suggest to a jury a fact that the parties have knowledge is not true. And oh, I'm sorry, I, I was going to make one more point, Your Honor. Go ahead. Let, uh, yeah, yeah. One of the arguments by petitioner, perhaps the, 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 the one that is going to the heart of it, is that even if petitioner is to make the argument that they have no evidence that it is not misleading. However, to answer that question, it would be misleading. Because even though this evidence has been precluded, the probative value of the evidence is recognized by that cautionary language. This was not just Torrin's DNA that was found. This was Torrin's DNA that was found on the clothing of the petitioner, specifically the underwear worn by the petitioner on that day when the evidence shows that he was the only adult who was watching her for the majority of that day. So while the defense has an innocent explanation that they have set forth, that doesn't mean that it is not evidence. There could be an innocent explanation for a smoking gun. There could be an innocent explanation for blood on one's hands. But it is still evidence. And in this case, that blood and that DNA evidence is circumstantial evidence. We've never said that this by itself proves the whole case. But it is one piece of circumstantial evidence. It is DNA evidence. It is a very powerful tool in, the, in determining the truth. And it is a piece of circumstantial evidence that indicates under the totality, when put together with all the other circumstantial evidence that we have, that he would have been with her at a time when he was the only adult and she was bleeding, that in conjunction with other circumstantial evidence that the state had cited to in previous pleadings is evidence that he directly abused her. And that's why we object so strongly to him saying there is no evidence. So, so if, if uh, Mr. Rainack in his opening were to say uh, to the jury, uh, I do not expect the state will offer any physical evidence or if you were to say, I do not expect, or you will not hear, go out on a limb and say, you will not hear the state offer any evidence, the state would object to either one of those. They would object to either one of those because we believe that it would be misleading, the inference being if they had that evidence, they would present it, therefore that evidence must not exist, and that is something we know is not true. And sorry, before you sit down, sure. uh, does that open the door to all of the, the DNA evidence, um, the, in addition to just the victim's blood on his, on his swimsuit, um, there, there's, other, there's other DNA evidence that's been excluded? Uh, no, because I, what we would be dealing with there is a statement by defense counsel that there is no evidence that he abused her on that day or, again, physically abused her on that day. The state's argument... Uh, and it's, it's a ruling that we lost. But the issue of, if you're referring to the semen evidence on, the, on Torrance panties, uh, that would not, it would not suddenly open the door for that evidence. This would simply open the door for blood on the swimsuit. Correct, yes. And DNA on the swimsuit. Y Especially yes, DNA we, swimsuit. yes, and for the state's purpose, it's essentially one and the same because it, Fox. yes, it, it's, it, it's the, it's a, it's a blood stain or a presumptive blood stain that's on the, we, it's his, un, it's his underwear that he was wearing, but they're apparently swim trunks. And it is from that stain that you end up with Torrin's DNA as the major contributor. There's not a suggestion of a sexual assault as a result of that evidence. It, it's simply the victim. He was in contact, whether her blood or skin cells uh, or something were on. It, it would be, it would be uh, well, from the state standpoint, it would be her blood. And the reason for that, you may recall that the defense, the, the petitioner has an exhibit of a transcript. The one for Dana Chapman, I believe it's on page three of the transcript, sort of sums it up. Uh, the DNA and the amount of DNA is consistent with coming from a fluid, recognizing that there may be some argument that it's, you know, horse blood and then her saliva, that aside, the state's position is this is this is her blood that was found. But that doesn't mean that it would open up the door to evidence of semen on the panties or any of the other sexual or molestation related evidence. 
I, and I apologize for going over. Thank no, you. Thank you. If I may comment before a question, um, to answer Judge uh, Cantani's um, question to Mr. Green, they actually did make that argument. They, they said that the semen was, as Mr. Green put it, clear evidence of a sexual assault. And that's the problem that they're doing with this evidence. They take one little piece of evidence, and I, I watch, it was with less than 20 seconds left when he started to address the actual evidence. First of all, it's presumptive for blood. It's not even a presumptively human blood. And it could be something else. It could be vegetable. It, it, it could be if, something. Can I interrupt? If, yes. If the, if the only thing, if the door is only open to the extent that it allows evidence of blood, of the victim's blood or some kind of fluid, um, and it, it doesn't allow any other evidence of uh, the defendant's semen on the victim's underwear, um, is, are you, is it your view that that's, that's still prejudicial to your client? Oh, absolutely. And under Jimenez, why did they wait three years? I mean, he, he's saying that the judge... But aren't, I, aren't you suggesting, I thought the argument was he, he had contact with her because he was there and he picked her up, but that doesn't mean he's, oh, he was responsible. Absolutely. But we may have to call our client to say that. And, and what he just told th this panel is not accurate in terms of my client, there's no question he was with her that day. He's, that part of his statement to the police comes in. She had no injuries. When Miss Buckman came home, she didn't say there was any injury. She didn't say there was any bleeding. She mentioned that um, she had a sore leg, but, but th there was no bleeding. The bleeding occurs when Miss Buckman goes into a separate room and throws her against a wall. There's no question that there's zero blood until Miss Buckman comes home and, t and takes the child into a separate room. There, I can tell the court, I'm putting it on the record, there's absolutely no evidence of any blood on that child prior to Miss Buckman taking her into another room. So for the state, they keep on talking about adv advocacy yields to the truth and trial facts. I haven't heard one word in the pleading. I waited, hopefully, I was hoping some, one of the judges would ask him a question. How is this evidence of physical abuse? I don't get it. That I understand in a case, and maybe to answer Judge Johnson's previous question, and this would be, I think, a question that the panel would still have to answer because I don't think, you know, I don't know that there's a case where if if it, if it was a burglary, my client had no connection with the house, and somehow the DNA got precluded. Let's say it's because it was late, and it showed that my client DNA or blood or whatever fingerprints were in the house, and I argued, well, the, there's no evidence. The state hasn't presented any evidence that my client was ever in the house because it got precluded because it was late. I still think that's a proper argument. But we're not even at that in this case. They're, they're, just like they linked semen to, he actually put in his pleading, this is clear evidence of a sexual assault. That not it's, it's a suggestion or a possibility or circumstantial evidence. He actually put in there, it's clear evidence. Just like they're claiming here that they don't even know if it's blood, they, it's the DNA of the child, but it, it said it's just as likely saliva or something else. And they're saying it's clear evidence of physical abuse. See, if the, if the semen evidence doesn't come in at all, the, your client is, you, you, you still view this as being very prejudicial to your client to, to have, if you say there, there's no evidence of uh, any, any physical evidence, why, why is that so prejudicial if you have a response that, uh, it, okay, there, there's some blood on there, but that, that doesn't show anything? It's just like in the Bruton case, and we're required to call our client to the stand. Based on other rulings, the court was asking about the semen, and I agree with Mr. Green, that wouldn't come in. But there's other evidence if our client takes a stand that comes in. There, there's certain other evidence. So, you're, so in order to explain away the, the presence of her blood and DNA on his shorts, you're you say, although you could explain that away, the, it would affect your, 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 your trial strategy and might require you to call your, def, your client. Oh, absolutely, because you've heard their argument, and, and the court's going to allow it, that that, that blood or that's that light stain, and it's light stain, which may or may not be blood, which has the, uh, tor uh, the, the child's DNA, which may or may not be whatever that's part of that stain or saliva, that that's clear evidence of physical abuse. So we, you know, we would have to come up and, and advise the jury, and it's, it's no different than when they sever cases and say, well, you're now forcing someone to take the witness stand. We had, uh, w w w w once this ruling came down, our decision was clear. We're, we're going to be forced to have our client take the witness stand, 
um, be, because of that, because there's other evidence that has been precluded unless our client takes the stand. Not, not this sperm evidence, but there's other evidence, statements he made to a CPS worker afterwards and other things that are damning that, that we weren't necessarily going to call our client. We, we believe based on the statements of our client that do come in, which in which he admits no wrong, and then Ms. Buckman's statements where she takes full responsibility and indicates our client did no wrong. But now we have to explain away something that was produced three years late. And again, I, 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 I may be repeating myself and I apologize, but I still haven't heard any explanation how in a case where he lived there, he, he, in his statements, he says, yeah, I lived there. She says he lived there. There's no question he lived there. He was there when the police arrived, when the paramedics arrived. But the issue is how does that little stain, which is not on underwear, is, is Mr. Green, it's on uh, swim trunks. How does that relate to physical abuse? And that's where I, that's where I can't grasp. I, the, the question is how you can take that leap. And I see what they do. As the court said, they believe that they're in a one bedroom. You know, all the people living in one bedroom, um, the, the previous, the, the uh, cousin described clothes all over that, that, you know, she was a terrible housekeeper, diapers everywhere closed. And they're wondering how some sperm might get on, you know, the child's clothing. And he actually puts in a pleading and he's arguing to let it in because he wanted to argue that's clear evidence of sexual assault. And that's exactly what he's trying to do now with this evidence, which is not evidence of, of physical abuse uh, by any stretch of any imagination. There's no blood spatter pattern. No, they haven't listed any experts that's going to say this is consistent with hitting the child and, you know, the blood coming out. And that's one of the problems that simply is not being addressed, I believe, okay. you know, in terms of the state. Okay. We have a couple of questions here. Absolutely. Do you think that you could argue, <laughs> argue, do you think you could state to the jury an opening statement on Monday, you know, something like, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, part of your job here is to listen to and, and uh, understand the evidence and, and watch for evidence that points in one direction or the other. I, I, I urge you to listen and see if the state presents any evidence of, of my client doing anything physical uh, on May 30, however you want to describe it. Judge, I can, but I don't think that's the way opening statements, I think that it has to be more powerful. I understand it's not an argument, but I think there's, there's a far cry, Your Honor, in answering your question from that versus saying, Please carefully watch the evidence. We do not anticipate that the state will produce any physical evidence indicating that this child was abused by our client. And so, Judge, you're talking about in a understand. I want to say it more strongly. Well, Judge, it's an emotional case. I will tell that this child was was badly no. abused. There's no. no question about it. It's a four year old who died. And there are many potential jurors that couldn't even sit on it just knowing those bare bone facts sure. or having to look at pictures. So we need to have something more than, you know, carefully look at the evidence. And I'll do respect, Judge. Could I do that? Yes. But that's what I'm being forced to do by their disclosure that they didn't even bother to try to test for for three years. How, how long a trial is it, is it supposed to be? Well, now it's it's going to go into, I believe, January. It was scheduled originally. Of the for evidence, the, 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 the taking of evidence on the guilt phase. Uh, oh, that'll be done, well, it's hard to say, I would say probably by, I don't know, November, maybe oh, earlier. Two months? Yes. For, uh, I mean, again, that's, that's a guess. But, I'm not, don't uh, give me that. Uh, how, uh, uh, notwithstanding, when we started talking, we talked about openings and touched on closings. Are, are you, uh, do you accept the cases that the state cited that limit the ability of a defense lawyer in questioning witnesses on cross and on direct from falsely implying the, ex the non-existence of other evidence. Do you, do you, All right, do you it, take it, those at face value? No, Judge, I, I, I do, but that's not the situation here. I, I wouldn't ask, is there any DNA or, or, or was there potential blood? But I think I could say, did you gather any physical evidence? You know, or, you know I, I could certainly ask questions uh, uh, of different people. Did you have any evidence of blood spatter? Did you have any evidence indicating that, you know, any uh, blood on, on the defendant? I think all those things that I want to bring out that are absolutely true, I shouldn't say on him because I realize that, that's the thing, but I'm saying on her that was his blood, for instance, you know, his blood, his 
his his his um, saliva, you know, those types of things, though, then then they're going to argue that opens the door to this evidence. And that's the problem. And it still doesn't address the fact that it's 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 not evidence of physical abuse. It was over three years old and they had it all along on a death penalty case. And no matter whether Miss Valenzuela was only dealing with non guilt phase or anything, that's just not an excuse to try a person and try to have a jury convince a jury to to uh, uh, render a death sentence it's inexcusable and they're talking about justice and all this stuff their delays and their failure to do this and then try to make these arguments that are not well grounded that in my opinion are in violation of the ethical rules argument as i said with the semen that's clear evidence of sexual assault but they didn't even get an indictment on it clear evidence of physical abuse all these things that they're arguing i think are completely improper and yet they're arguing in front of a court of appeals that it ought to be allowed so just give give yes, us a, a couple of hypotheticals about uh questions that you would anticipate asking a detective on cross examination that you believe would uh would implicate the order certainly was there any evidence gathered on the child um blood from my client um anything indicating that he had physically hit her are there any uh are there any wounds on my client that are are consistent with him having struck a child you know with his fist or or anything else it, was there was there any any you know those are the types of questions that i would be asking which are absolutely the answer is no um and I, there's no question you heard what he believed opened the door it, it was basically if i simply say there's no physical evidence he believes essentially anything opens a door and i would but in your in your view that that's not a compelling argument you have a, you have an explanation you can't you even make that explanation without without calling your client to testify to say there's okay there's there's some dry, there there may be the victim's blood may be on his his clothing, there's a perfectly logical explanation for that. Judge, if there's no actual evidence of that, sir, I think I can make that argument, but I think it's much weaker than actually saying I actually picked up the child. What I cited to the court is that he performed CPR. However, there's no actual, the, the other evidence is that he actually picked up the child to try to you know, kind of revive her. And that's where it, that's where it got on him. And he would also have to testify, Your Honor, because they're going to argue how did it get on the swim trunks that he was wearing the swim trunks essentially as gym shorts like many people do around their house and he put on his jeans because he knew the fire department was coming and he, and we know this for a fact that the, the um miss buckman was then performing cpr when the when the firefighters arrived but he has to take the stand to explain all that sir I, how am i going to how am i going to argue an inference well you can assume ladies and gentlemen that he was only in his swim trunks and, and shirt and then he put his pants on i have to have him testify to that because they're i they've already made this argument and i think they made it in their in their pleadings that well he, le, earlier in the day he was dressed you know with his jeans and now he's not and so the presumption is he isn't so we would absolutely judge have to come to the stand i think especially if they're going to be allowed and clearly the judge is going to allow him to argue that that's clear evidence of physical abuse not not just the possibility clear evidence of physical abuse we have got to put them on the stand and that's the fundamental problem that we're having for their late disclosure we are being penalized far greater than they are because i don't think that's any evidence of physical abuse they're going to make that argument i wouldn't because i don't think a jury is is going to be stupid enough to buy it but i don't know well but for the late disclosure the evidence would be coming in would it not that is a possibility, but I don't know that it would because it, it, it and one of the cases isn't Judge Morris isn't the order pretty clear that it it will come in in the uh, the penalty phase because there will be time to have rebutted it. it is, oh, I understand that's her order in the in the penalty phase. That, isn't that make it pretty clear that there's not really a question in her mind about the reliability of the evidence that it would have come in, but for the late disclosure. Judge, we didn't get to that point to argue it. And the reason we didn't is because it was such a late disclosure and it was theirs to argue. But now that we got to interview, re-interview, we'd interviewed them previously, re-interviewed them, we now found out they don't they don't even know if it's blood. They don't even know if it's human blood. It's very light blood. They're, they're, 
Un unlike their contention, the lab uh, uh, analyst was very clear. I cannot say at all that that's Torrin's blood. Uh, she's not saying that she's saying there's DNA of Torrin. She says it could be saliva. It could be many other things. I said, is one more likely than the other? The answer is no. So, um, again, we're now scrambling to put things together because of their late disclosure. I'm here today, and we didn't get to start the trial because of their late disclosure. My client, right to a speedy trial, has at least been somewhat abrogated because of their late disclosure. All of those things are because their late disclosure, um, none of it is attributable to the defense. So we're now scrambling around trying to rebut something that they could have tested three years ago. So I think we really come full circle as to I'm the one now that has to change my strategy. I have to be the one that crafts something because of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to both sides for showing up for your briefing. We appreciate it. We'll, we will issue an order uh, in due course. Uh, our intent is to issue it before uh, before the end of the week, before 5 p.m. the end of the week. Thank you. Uh, we stand adjourned.